Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha and welcome back to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. Hey, it's been two weeks since I've been on the air. First Hurricane Lane interrupted everything out here and had us a good practice run for a, a potentially pretty nasty hurricane coming right into Hawaii, uh, right up the chain into Oahu. Um, when I look at back at my old hurricane tracking days in the National Guard, it looked like one that could have potentially been pretty, pretty bad by hitting us with that front right quadrant coming right up the chain. So I dodged a bullet there, made it through that week, and then this past week, well, we just moved our HCAT offices where we've been for over 25 years, and we uh, shut everything down and uh, moved into some new office space. It's amazing how much stuff you accumulate in 25 years, but that's what kept me off uh, off the air last weekend, last week. Anyway, I got a great show for you today with a gentleman named Chris McWenny. It's not his first rodeo for us. We're going to have a little fireside chat with Chris from uh, Ohio, and he makes some outstanding equipment that's uh, great for the... the um, the scale that, I, I mean, he'll grow bigger, but he specializes in uh, units that are more um, small scale friendly, let's just put it that way. He'll, he'll take exception to that, I think, but it's, uh, it's a great equipment. Um, our units that we have out here, we have two of them, are two kilograms of hydrogen a day, and we use them for uh, our in-shop uh, testing work and also out at the Air National Guard for our weapons loader. So Chris, welcome to the show. Good to have you on board, and uh, I'm glad you could make it in. I, I hear you got a hurricane coming your way, or at least the remnants of one blowing into Ohio now. Yeah, thanks, Dan, for having me today. Yeah, it's uh, the one that came up from Florida just made it here about 30 minutes ago, so got a little less, little windy and a little rain. So. Okay. All right, well, I, I don't know if people remember much about your intro from last time. Give, give us a, a quick rundown on your background and how you got Millennium Rain started. And, um, and then let's look at some of your equipment and some of the things you've been doing over the last year or two. Sure, well, uh, it, so I had a friend of mine show me something uh, on his desk one evening and I asked him what that was. It looked really weird. It was about the size of a little pill bottle or something. And he said it was an electrolyzer. And I said, what's an electrolyzer? And he said, well, it's uh, they make uh, hydrogen and oxygen out of um, uh, electricity and water. And I said, hmm, what good is hydrogen? He said, well, space shuttle runs on it. And I was like, dang, we can make that kind of power out of water and electricity. Why aren't we doing that instead of gasoline now? That was like 27 or 28 years ago. And when he said that, and so uh, my mind started working on it and trying to figure out the two reasons he said it, that nobody was doing it was because gasoline was still like 75 cents a gallon. And, um, the um, electrolyzers and the equipment to make the hydrogen cost a lot of money and just wasn't economically feasible and, and, and it also took a lot of electricity. And so I thought, well, I'm, you know, I was really naive and I thought surely I could make it cheap enough, cheaper than what anybody else was making it and didn't even know how one was worked, how one worked. And then um, I thought that we could use wind and solar possibly to drive the electrolysis and you could spread the time, the money for that capital expenditure over a period of time. And so, um, you know, Dave and I had a conversation, Dave, my partner, Dave Erbal, we um, had a conversation for six hours in a car on the way home from a meeting in North Carolina for another business we were in together. And, and um, played devil's advocate for six hours and thought we came up with a way to make something like that work. And then two weeks later, Dave quit uh, the business we were in. And I didn't see him again for 13 years. And consequently, I didn't do anything with the idea. And then uh, in 2001, uh, when 9-11 happened and the business I was in was a financial services business and, and um, you know, it rocked the world and stock market crashed and I was looking for something else you know, to try to do to make up the income I'd lost and and uh, started looking and and uh, really discovered uh, more about hydrogen and, and started developing it and started developing a patent. And then the day I sent the patent, I ran into Dave again after 13 years of not seeing him. And it was like a meant-to-be thing. So 
Um, we started working in my garage in 2004 on the product, and by 2013, we moved out of my little garage and into a big old Cadillac dealership of 40,000 square feet, and now we own that clear and free, and we've got 25 products commercialized, and, and um, we're ready to start going out to the world with products that can really revolutionize the, um, the um, uh, energy industry. And so in, in all that time, you know, that you were developing this technology and, and learning about it, you know, because, you, you know, you got to understand it before you can go into business with it. You know, if you're like me, I just, the more I learned about the hydrogen, the more excited I got. And, and uh, it's like, I'm, I'm a kind of a pessimist up front, so I try and shoot holes in everything. And I, I just couldn't find a whole lot of downside to the hydrogen piece. Is that the same with you? Yeah, it definitely is the thing that keeps me motivated. I mean, the obstacles and the mountains that we're climbing and moving and and jumping over walls and, and uh, things are just, you know, monumental. And um, the fact that, that it's so obvious that the world needs to go to this for a multitude of reasons um, is what keeps me motivated because uh, the world needs this big time. Well, let's look at some of the stuff that... Uh that you've been working on over the past couple of years. We'll bring up some, some graphics. And the first one is uh, a bus that um, you got refueling at one of your hydrogen stations. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, um, so this is at Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research. It's a um, 12 kilogram a day production facility with compression um, and, and uh, a production compression and purification in a build in an enclosure that's off to the right of the picture there that you can't see and then the the enclosure that you can see there that's a 24 kilogram uh, storage system with uh, 6,000 psi and that front door opens and that's the nozzle to fuel that bus and that bus hauls kids around campus and it's on loan from a uh, 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 company in uh, Canton Ohio Cleveland area that has 12 fuel cell buses that they're putting out and um, and running up there uh, for SARTA. And um, so um, we've been fueling that for over a year now and learning a lot from, from, from that process. And, and the 12 kilograms a day is enough to keep that bus going uh, around the campus? So it was definitely undersized. That bus has 50 kilograms of storage in the, in the white part of the roof up there with wow. great big tanks. And uh, so it's only 24 kilograms. So we can only get it about um, half full all the time. And um, and so uh, it, our system had to run 24-7 around the clock, seven days a week to keep up with it. So it could just have enough fuel to run five days a week, and then we'd have to catch up with it running over the weekend. So okay. if we had to do that one over again, we, we'd have to put in twice the size of system. And does it run off wind or solar, or are they got a touch of the grid right now? No, it's just running off the grid there at uh, OSU. Okay. All right, and the next image we got coming up is, um, it looks real familiar. It looks like a place we just moved out of down on Cook Street in Honolulu. And that's an MJ-1E jammer. We call it a jammer. It's a weapons loader that um, U.S. Hybrid built for the Air Force. And behind it is um, the Millennium Rain unit that we purchased from you that we used to, um, to actually fill that vehicle and some of our other vehicles when we're doing our testing and maintenance at our facility. So um, what's different about the, the unit that you see there in the background and the, the ones that you make now? So I would say that this unit in the background was like our third generation of this, and we're on our fifth generation now. Um, and you'll see in the picture coming up, this is actually classified as a Model 100, where it does two kilograms a day. And this one had two kilograms of storage on it. Um, and then you can see there's some uh, uh, some uh, cylinders in the back of it that gives it an extra six um, uh, kilograms of storage, so it's eight altogether. So, um, and and so the the, it, the the new ones just got a lot of advancements that we've actually learned part in part from you running it and and out there and running into things that maybe we needed to tweak a little better or fix a little better and that kind of thing. And 
uh, people like that have been extremely helpful for us over the period of time. And and so um, and and so the next one that you're going to see in the next picture, I think, it, it shows the uh, the much improved version. Right, and it's two kilograms a day, also. Yeah, the next one you're going to see is two kilograms a day. Yeah, we actually had it up for a little while. Now we got the the image of uh, that unit in the truck, and this one's going to where? So the the well, you back up one and don't go to the truck. Go to the one with the uh, the, the sitting in the okay. shop. Okay. All right. Can we back up one, okay. Robert? Yeah. Okay. Are you back? Are you back? Are you there? Yeah, we're okay. there. So, um, that that one is uh, this one here uh, was commissioned by the Navy, uh, and uh, their uh, research lab is uh, running uh, some is testing filming drones. They've discovered a lot of people have actually discovered that uh, flying drones can fly three to six times further on hydrogen than they can on batteries. And so that's a really important thing when you're trying to get flight time out of something so you don't have to come back and fuel, get a lot more distance. And so this is a, this is the new Model 100 that replaces the one that you got. And so what we've done now is we have uh, four different models that fit in the same package, a Model 100, a Model 102, a Model 104, and a 200. And if you look at them on the outside, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart until you open the door. When you open that front door, there's a, either a two kilogram stack a day or a four kilogram stack a day in there. And then they will have from, from four kilograms standard of storage up to uh, eight kilograms in, in increments of two kilograms at a time. So a 100 has two kilograms a day production with four kilograms storage, a 102 has six kilograms of storage, and a 104 has eight kilograms of storage, and then a 200 is four kilograms a day of production with eight kilograms of storage. So then the next picture is um, showing it uh, loading in the truck. It gives you kind of an idea of the scale of it and the size of it, and that's where we're getting ready to go off to deliver the unit. All right, and, th and then that one for the Navy, like you say, they're using it for drones. Which for me is uh, that's a an easy uh, thing to make because you know what I tell everybody about the hydrogen versus so I say batteries when you're trying to run electric motors is the weight um, you know how do you beat hydrogen for energy density by weight you you just can't there's no battery in the world that can beat the energy density of hydrogen um, by weight and so when you when you sit there and think. If you put a, a fuel cell in a, and, and put solar panels on the wing of an airplane, you could actually take the wastewater that's coming off the fuel cell and put a small electrolyzer in there and turn it back into hydrogen and even make the airplane fly longer by using the wastewater or the, the expelled water or vapor that comes off the fuel cell and you could extend that life. So I know that Boeing is uh, working on a large scale platform that right now it goes up and stays airborne for three days. And their goal is to get it to stay airborne 10 days. And that's what you can do with hydrogen that you can't do with batteries. Yeah, incredible. Okay, the next image coming up is um, one of, um, it looks like the campus again. Yeah, we're back at Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research in Columbus, Ohio. And that is a little gem that they had. They have uh, two fuel cells on there that are uh, little 1,500-watt uh, fuel cells and batteries. And um, uh, they, uh, we, we worked out a deal and traded that, so we have that in our shop now. But this shows the entire Model 300 at OSU with the building or the enclosure that was off camera when the bus picture was up a little bit ago. So you can see that one. As a, you, it comes in color schemes, so you can get it, you know, painted uh, and uh, um, powder coated. Um, or in the next picture, it, I think is a, um, it's the same type of Model 300, but that one's all stainless steel. Right. This yeah. One, we have that image up now. Yeah, this one's uh, at Sonoma in Sonoma, California, at the uh, Stone Edge Farms uh, microgrid. And this is a winery, a 14-acre uh, farm, uh, working farm, and they have um, uh, uh, three uh, Toyota Mirais and uh, 
couple of uh, Honda Clarities, and they run uh, those cars with this station. Um, you can see the uh, uh, the, um, the the Toyota Mirai there, the blue car. That's a fuel cell vehicle lined up to fuel up there at the station. Mm -hmm. Now, this one has been. Well, I got to say something about these guys because they're like you guys and Blue Planet. Um, they have helped us out so much. We learned how to really collect data on the fueling protocols for the cars and make sure that the tank is filling at the right speed and doesn't overheat. And they've just been instrumental in helping us prove to the rest of the industry that we have a less expensive way to fuel vehicles. And um, we're really making some uh, big leaps and bounds in the codes and standards arenas. Um, with this, with this, uh, with, because of the information we've collected from them, so we owe those guys a big debt of gratitude. Yeah, and we're going to spend a little bit more time talking. We're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail about those standards and some of the challenges that you've had getting the industry at large to accept um, the technology and and some of the standards and codes that that you've gotten real familiar with and, and you've had to adapt to. So we'll be back in about 60 seconds. And aloha, my name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always, Enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii, who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man and Chris McWinney, live direct from Ohio, where it's raining because they're getting their own aftermaths of a hurricane right now. And we're talking a little bit about a project that Chris has been working on for several years out in a winery in California. And as most of you that follow hydrogen know, California has kind of been the state that's been leading the charge on hydrogen with infrastructure and with vehicles. So if you want to buy a Hyundai, uh, pro, um, production Hyundai fuel cell vehicle or a Toyota um, Mirai <clears throat> or a Honda Clarity, California is the place to go. In fact, most of the people that even have them on the East Coast go to California to buy them and drive them to the, back to the East Coast. But um, it comes with some, some uh, challenges when you're the first. And Chris's system is um, a little bit different. It, it's, it, he works mostly on the low pressure side right now. And the cars go to 10,000 PSI. Um, his systems go to 5,000 PSI, um, which is good in a lot of ways. It, um, it makes things simpler and easier for the user. Um, but it creates some challenges. And look, Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about just getting a company like Toyota to accept a system that's a little bit different that they're not used to. You've got, a, you've got solutions that address their issues, but how hard it is to talk to the, a big company and say, I've got answers to your questions. You know, here's my answers. You know, why can't you accept them? So to give you can talk a little bit about that. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, first of all, the state of California is very generous in putting together a $200 million pool of money uh, to put out fueling stations. And um, they've got programs that can reimburse or uh, like grant um, or take up uh, some of the slack on what it costs to fund these stations. That's up to 75 to 85%. And so what's the the pool is uh, looking for is stations that can do 100 to 200 kilograms a day at 10,000 PSI and be J2601 uh, standardized fueling protocols. 
And so um, those are the only companies that can do that are the only ones that are getting that money. And it's been a very successful program. They've got uh, 32, I think, now stations out. They've got 5,000 cars running around California. And they're really running up against it from a standpoint of not having enough hydrogen or hydrogen stations. And I was just sitting with um, one of the leaders of one of the companies that's got more stations out than anybody, and they said they've got cars lined up um, three to ten deep almost every day at the stations they got. Um, so there's a huge demand as this infrastructure has really taken off. And what Millennium Marine Energy is trying to do is say, look, you know, what if we can build something a little less costly? That station you're looking at on the picture right there, we can install that for 325000 The big stations that they're building now are between $3 million and and um, $4 million, depending on how much their output is. And so what you have to do is you have to think strategically. If you're going to put out $3 million worth of station and there's only four cars in the area and it's making a, you know, can, it can pump out 100 kilograms a day and, you know, the four cars need, you know, uh, two, two to three kilograms at each fill and that they're not going to come back for a week, you got way more than you need and there's no way you can ever make a payoff on that station. So. In order for the hydrogen fueling infrastructure to work, you have to be able to make it uh, uh, financially feasible for three, three levels. You have to be able to make it feasible so that the car owner um, can actually save money by buying hydrogen where it's cheaper than a gallon of gas equivalent. The station owner can buy the station and put it on and make money selling hydrogen, and the manufacturer and the people that are installing it can make money on that end. And if you got all three of those things can work, then you don't need the government subsidies and you can actually create a business that is compelling and will be sustainable on its own. So what you need to have is something that's a less costly approach. And that's why we are at 6,000 PSI in the station and the dispenses at 5,000 PSI into the car. And yes, they get a half a bill and they go maybe 160 miles instead of 320 miles, but that's still double what the average uh, battery-driven car is, not counting the Tesla, and um, you can still fuel with our system in eight minutes and go that distance. Yeah. So, But we don't have any pre-chillers. We don't have to compress it up that high. The, the, the um, fittings are all less expensive, and, um, and, and so and it's made on site. You don't have to pull it. You, don't, you know, this has its own electrolyzer, everything made on site, <laughs> purified on site, compressed on site stored and dispensed. So um, when you when you run the numbers, it's just much more economical. And then what you've done is that you've made the the the, the production capacity meet the demand. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you can scale it up then when more cars come in, you take this station out and you put in a bigger one. And you just keep growing it with the demand instead of trying to put this great big thing out there and duplicate all the gas stations that we have in the world today that are filling 100 cars a day, and which is what they're trying to do. And if you think back in time, what originally happened was is that when the first internal combustion engines came out, they basically had a 200-gallon tank up on stilts and a gravity filled your car, and, and, and they just had a couple of those out there. Well, they're, they, Right now, what they're trying to do with the infrastructures are trying to jump way out in the future and build them and make them look like they are right now, even though the demand's not there. So now, because we've taken this approach, which sounds right when you say it like that, it's caused some challenges for us in fueling because we had to create a fueling protocol on our own that didn't require pre-chilling and would still fill the car in a reasonable amount of time. And when the codes first came out, um, and back in 2009, 2010, they had this chart. It was chart D for a 35 MPA fill, which is 5,000 PSI. And if you followed that chart, it would take you an hour and a half to fill up your car. And nobody's going to want to do that. And so, you know, when we came along um, in 2013, uh, actually in 2011, we filled a General Motors fuel cell vehicle, and they brought their computer down and tested our system and showed that we were actually doing it correctly. And we started building on that knowledge, and then when we release to the world, like these other car companies, because I'm part of these codes and standards committees, and we started sharing the data that we had, and they didn't believe it. They thought we were some kind of crazy maniacs that were going to tear things up, and 
because it was boring to them because the, every all the work they did said it took an hour and a half and we were doing it in eight minutes. And they didn't understand uh, physically how we could do that. And so over the last so many um, years, three or four years, um, we've been continuing to collect data. We've had this information in front of them at Toyota's headquarters at SAE meetings, at Honda's headquarters at SAE meetings, and at SAE headquarters in Detroit, which I'm going there next week for another meeting. Um, and and so slowly but surely, they're starting to see that maybe there is an alternative method, and now it's just a matter of trying to make this fit into the code and make it um, fit with everything else that's going on. Okay, yeah, I, I wanna just go back and point out some really important points you just made. Number one, when you started your company, it was all about putting the price point at the right spot to fill a demand and make it all work. When you said the stations are three to four million dollars, a lot of those stations, even at the low end, aren't producing hydrogen. They're just dispensing stations with big tube trailers behind them. So That's right. the cheap production that they're getting off of steam reform meth, uh, methane and stuff like that, they're producing the hydrogen as cheaply as they can and they're driving it in trucks and delivering it someplace and it's not even really clean hydrogen. Number two, you know, you talked about compression. There's a couple things that happen with those 10,000 PSI cars that you have to pre-chill because what people don't understand is when, when you're evacuating the hydrogen out of your tanks, those tanks get cool. But when you're pushing it into the car, that car's tank gets hot. And they're trying to, and not so much that that's dangerous, but what it is is it, it messes with the calculation of exactly how much fuel you're getting in the cars. So it's not so much a safety issue as a keeping the volume standard issue between the dispenser and the car. And yours, yours is a mechanical control where theirs is a physics. They're, they're dropping the temperature and they're pushing it in and, and they're monitoring the temperature of the tank real time where, where you really don't have to do that. And so I, I think your system is, is spot on and it's, it's, it fills a very special um, place in the marketplace that's really important right now. And, and I think that's really critical. That's why we like um, working with your system and, and dealing with it because it fills a very special place. Let's quickly throw up some of the last pictures. I'll let you go through them really quick because we're coming up on the end of our time here. But there's your trolley in okay. Dubai. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that was a great adventure. Um, it's, uh, it was a, a, a 12 kilogram a day system. This, this trolley has batteries on it, and so it put a fuel cell on it so it could get a range extender on it. And it went around the track in downtown Dubai. So that was pretty interesting to go to an international com country and install that. Go ahead with the next picture. Okay. Um, this, this one is a 3D rendering of our new 10,000 PSI station. So we are doing 10,000 PSI. Um, and uh, so go to the next picture. So not only are we a rendering, but here is um, actually almost built and I just left it tonight and we've got 6,000 PSI in each one of those tanks and next week we're going to be taking it on up to 13,000 PSI in those red tanks and there's two banks there it'll cascade and it'll actually hook up to our model 300 and take it from 6,000 to 10,000 with just one plug and play unit and you, so when you get ready and you've got enough cars there and you've got the volume to afford it, you can just take this small little unit and then bump yourself right up to a 70 MPA station really economically. Uh, we're going to be able to sell that unit for less than 150000 or around 150000 I think. Yeah. I'd, I'd, like to, to the next I'd like to point out, though, this station is, you can see where the forklift tongues fit inside. It's basically a piece of equipment. It's not, it's not a building. It's not a structure. You basically put this in place connect up the water, connect up the electricity, and you're off and running. And when you need to build a bigger station, you build the big station, and you put this someplace where you need it that doesn't require the volume. Right, Stan, one more thing really quickly. Uh, last week we had CSA in, uh, for the 11th day. Uh, CSA is a nationally recognized um, third-party laboratory, like getting something UL certified. CSA stands for Canadian Standards Association, and we actually developed a code and standard that uh, uh, they are they have adopted and are um, are uh, putting uh, 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 copyright on and and making it public. And we are we just passed all the tests for our fueling protocols and our fueling. Um, 
um, quality of our hydrogen that's produced by our machines and many other tests like rain tests and and, okay. and shake tests and all kinds of stuff on our equipment. So uh, after they get done writing the reports and submitting it, if all goes well, by mid-October, we should be the first company in the world to have nine products DSA certified to fuel. So that means you don't have to, it really helps you when you go to install these stations out there in the world uh, from a standpoint of the authority having jurisdiction giving you a permit. All right, Chris, well, we've, we've actually banged up against the end of our time and went a little bit over, but it's been great talking to you again, and we, we're going to have you back again in a couple of you know, weeks or so, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the certifications and standard. But thanks again for uh, being on the show this week, and until next week, Friday, Standard Energy Man signing off. Hey.